Today's program is presented by the Grown Ups Member Led Forum, and it's titled Relieving Social Isolation Among Seniors. I'm Katie Hafner, your host for today, and I'd like to extend a welcome to any new Commonwealth Club members who are joining us today in cyberspace. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our distinguished panelists. First, Patrick Arbor, the founder and director of the Center for Elderly Suicide Prevention and Grief-Related Services. Our pr their program began in 1973 with the launch of the 24-Hour Friendship Line, an accredited crisis intervention hotline and warm line that serves older people and younger disabled people in California and throughout the country. They also provide grief services for people of any age who've experienced traumatic loss. They merged with the Institute on Aging in 1997. Then we have Andy Gaines, who's the founding executive director of Ashby Village, a nonprofit organization supporting older adults to age independently and in their community in seven cities in the East Bay. Andy also helped launch Village Movement California, a coalition of grassroots organizations seeking to revolutionize the experience of aging. And we have Emma Davis, who's the Director of Programming at Rhoda Goldman Plaza, which is among the jewels of San Francisco's assisted living and memory care communities. Emma develops and implements therapeutic programming for residents, individual and group therapy for residents with dementia, and family education at Rhoda Goldman. Uh, and last, uh, not quite last, penultimately, we have John Blazek, who's the executive director of day services at OnLock. In this role, he expands and leads programs that include the 30th Street Senior Center, the soon-to-open Open House, and OnLock Community Day Services Program. He also leads OnLock's philanthropy and development efforts. And then, finally, we have Gloria Duffy, who's the president and CEO of the Commonwealth Club. Previously, Gloria was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. She manages the care, and this is why we've asked Gloria to be on this panel today. She manages the care for her 96-year-old mom, who lives with her, and Gloria occasionally speaks, writes, and works with public officials on issues about protecting seniors. And then there's me. I'm Katie Hafner, and I'm a journalist. I write quite a bit about um, health care, so I've been pretty busy recently. Uh, and um, I write for the New York Times. And uh, the reason I believe that I was asked to be on this panel is that I wrote a um, story a few years ago about loneliness, kind of an epidemic of loneliness um, around the country, around the world actually, that's turned into a huge uh, public health problem. And uh, it's something that people don't really think about much uh, in terms of actual physical health. And uh, that's something I think we need to address today. Uh, loneliness is, um, it's, a, it's a true epidemic. Uh, the first thing I want to do before we um, go to the panelists is just uh, make a distinction that uh, psychologists and geriatricians and people who study loneliness among older adults, the difference between social isolation, what we're hearing a lot with COVID is uh, they talk about uh, a lot, obviously we all know about social distancing now, and then there are concerns about that leading to social isolation. And academics make a pretty strict distinction between social isolation and loneliness. And what they say is that one can be socially isolated and not feel lonely. And so uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the phenomenon of loneliness as a result 
of social isolation. You know, also, obviously, you can be surrounded by people and feel lonely, um, but that's not very relevant right now. So let's start with Patrick, and why don't you uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing right now. Well, what I'm hearing, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, group uh, this morning or this afternoon, and uh, I've been making a lot of calls uh, to older adults and younger disabled individuals, um, you know, now remotely because of the uh, need for physical distancing. And just the other day when I called one of my older uh, clients who lost her husband about 15 years ago, lives alone. And uh, when I called her this morning and she picked up the phone and said, hi, Patrick, I am scared to death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm hearing that uh, quite a bit from our older clients, whether they're on the friendship line or in our grief program. And uh, it really struck me as um, a very hard way to live being scared to death. And uh, so when I asked her about that, you know, what's happening, what, what, what is she experiencing? And she said, it's primarily this unpredictability, mm -hmm. this lack of control. She said, in my life as a woman in my late seventies, I have my routine and I value that routine. And she said, I never realized how much I valued that routine until it has been taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And she said, I feel like the, the thing that I need is control and I just don't have it. And um, the outcome of that, she's experiencing as panic and fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, as she has said to me numerous times, I want someone to tell me when this is going to be over. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and of course, that isn't something we can say uh, right now. Uh, but what I could feel really helps her is the fact that what is predictable are my calls. She knows when they're going to happen. Um, she knows they will happen. And she knows that I will acknowledge her feelings. And that's really something that is very important for her because she said she has no one else to say these things to. So when I say to her, it makes sense to me that you feel scared. And let's just talk about that. And I, and I know that matters. And at the end of the call, she says, I do feel better. And I'm really looking forward to our next mm -hmm. call. Mm -hmm. And so having that in place is very important for her. So that's what I'm seeing from this is that although people are at home by themselves, and I often hear people say this, well, they don't have to be alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a little trouble with that because I think that people who have been living alone for a long time, they do feel alone. They feel lonely, as you were pointing out, Katie, earlier, mm -hmm. that, that, that description of social isolation versus loneliness. And what I find, by and large, our clients are really, really lonely. Um, and not a lot of people are reaching out to them. And I hope that changes uh, down the road that we learn from this and to be more mindful and more connected as a community. So thank you for that. And there are a few things I want to come back to um, once we get into the discussion. Andy, as someone who is very steeped in the, the concept and the practice of aging in place. I was just <laughs> appreciating, Patrick, your um, <laughs> reflection about uh, isolation and loneliness and um, I do feel like speaking from the village perspective, uh, uh, we're having a slightly different experience. Villages um, are not where adults live, just some context, but how we live um, in the homes and neighborhoods that we love. And we uh, integrate support with volunteers who are helping out. So in, in these days of isolation, I think the experience that we're trying to impart and people are getting is that we're apart, but, but not alone. And um, when this shelter in place was first instituted, I was just astounded and gratified to experience the that the level of community that we had built and the level of uh, support and infrastructure that we had established 
were relatively solid and in place so that our members, I don't know, certainly were apart, but there's continually this uh, expression of gratitude for the type of support that people are feeling. Um, we have, um, uh, in addition to the community and the connections that people have built with one another through interest groups and neighborhood groups and ways of connecting um, that builds a sense of trust, we also provide volunteer support to help people out. And so we have a core of about 300 vet, vetted and screened and trained volunteers who are ready to kind of know the systems and are ready to jump in. And while in this time where there's social distancing, we've been able to adjust our systems such that we can be available to support people with the essentials of getting groceries and getting medications, but also to feel connected and support. So one of, uh, I'll tell a story or two, one of the first things that happened was the, when the shelter in place was announced, we initially sent out um, a, a note to all of our volunteers asking, will you be available to call out to our members, to give calls? Because in general, they were socially visiting, et cetera, but now it's shifted. And we had within the first day about 30 volunteers who stepped forward to start making recurring calls to our members to check in on a mm -hmm. weekly basis. Um, the other piece that, that happens is we, every morning we send out requests to our volunteers for, to assist our members with the types of things I mentioned, um, as well as technology support. And within, within the first hour, they're all taken. And some of our late sleeping volunteers are really frustrated because they can't get enough to do and they, they don't necessarily want that. One of our volunteers um, was really, really frustrated. He went to a grocery store, was shopping for one of our members and um, you know got the food, went to the member's home. And when he passed this to her from a distance, of course, um, he was so touched by the relief and the gratitude that this person felt to have their groceries that it totally, his frustration totally, mm. you know, uh, dissolved away. So I think part of the thing that we've been really <laughs> focusing on is active communication in this time, because it's really important for people to feel like we're here for them. And that there's, even though there's this disruption, there's something that's consistent and here. So we've done regular regular updates, et cetera. And we started, um, I think the most popular thing is uh, what we call the daily dose of dopamine. So every morning at 10 a.m., <laughs> uh, everyone receives an email with a, a video or a cartoon or an image that really kind of livens the day and makes more of this, this uh, moment. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm actually, I think in general, I'm, I'm grateful to be on this call because I feel like as much as a challenge as this is, and as difficult as it is, it's also an opportunity. And we're definitely feeling like rather than pulling back from mm -hmm. our activities and our engagement, we're actually moving more, more toward and encouraging, helping our interest groups to go online, mm -hmm. creating programming that can engage with people. Next week, we have a a group of people who have been using creativity um, to liven up their their days, and they're going to be sharing some of that with other with others in the community, so mm -hmm. that we can all kind of use some of that. So I'm really grateful that we've established this within our village and the village movement, and um, I'm excited to hear the different ways that people are dealing with it in different contexts. That's great. Thank you. And. Um, We'll come back to that uh, idea of the of moving forward, of using this as a way to move forward, which is a great uh, a great notion. So, John, I want to apologize. I was reading your bio, and I realized the one I had radically uh, edited is not the one that I'm staring at. So, uh, Did I get a because, promotion on that? Oh, yeah, I don't right know up. what happened. It was, a, it was my, my glitch on my end. The one I printed out is the wrong one. But uh, one thing about Onlock that I think is important for people to know is it was started in 1971 in Chinatown, right. and it's Cantonese for a uh, graceful, peaceful place. Is that what it is? Yeah, peaceful abode or a peaceful home. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. So. Exactly. So, um, why don't you? Can you build on what Andy was saying? I can. Yeah. And also, Patrick, it's a, a slightly different twist. Um, but you know, going back to the history of Unlock, fifty years ago, uh, the organization in Chinatown and North Beach really was born of a need in the community. So, 
you'll see that today. And I think through with all my colleagues here, you know, that there's a need in the community and then our organizations come together uh, and rise up to meet those needs. And, and it's inspiring and exciting to hear their stories. One thing I wanted to talk about was the before and after just two months ago, uh, I as at 30th Street, and uh, 30th Street's the largest multi-purpose senior center in the city. And just and, uh, and one just to interrupt, and you did you did a ten million dollar renovation recently, right? On that, yeah, yeah. And um, it's an incredibly active place. If you could, there's a choir, senior choir, a garden where they even made their own honey from bees. There's oh. uh, a Latin dance on Friday afternoons. Uh, there's art and music and exercise classes and all these great, we even have a beauty salon. There's all this activity and wonderful things going on. These are a little bit different than what Patrick was talking about, where people are isolated. These were active seniors right. that were engaging in community and having a wonderful time. And so suddenly find themselves sheltering in place and uh, finding themselves in a new situation of isolation or loneliness. And so we tried to figure out how to deal with that in a new way. Uh, and I will tell a story. We have a woman here named Jeannie, and she's a wonderful person. And we were once interviewing her for a story. And she said something that I still remember. And she said, when I started coming to 30th Street, I've never had so many friends in all my life. And uh, when, we, when, when the pandemic first started, we moved our congregate meals where people could come here for a meal each day. And we created a to-go meal where you could pick it up. And I saw Jeannie and I said to her, because um, we talk about that line from time to time, mm -hmm. that, that you have so many friends. And I said uh, to her, as she was picking up her meal, I said, you know, you still have friends. And she said, I feel that. And I know that. Oh. And I said, do you still have more friends than you ever had before? And she said, yes. How old is uh, Jeannie? She's, she would be mad if I told you, so I'm going to hold that to myself. <laughs> uh, but I would say she is a senior, and she was um, talking then about, and with me, that we just have to be more deliberate and intentional, like Patrick was saying, mm -hmm. that um, you got to make the time to make the call and to put aside the time to say, this is what I'm going to do. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's changing in the world. And I learned that professionally working remotely. I'm not going to bump into people in the hallway, casually ask them how they are. I have to make sure that I am deliberate and intentional. And that I believe is something that's really gonna be important to us as we move through this, this process. Okay, good. So Emma, uh, Rhoda Goldman, that's gonna be very interesting to talk to you about that because I'm assuming no visitors can come to Rhoda Goldman now. Correct. Yes, we have uh, no visitor policy. We're only allowing essential healthcare workers into the facility mm -hmm. at this time. Uh, so no visitors, which is a huge change from, you know, how we normally operate. Um, and really, when the shelter in place order went into effect, we really had to kind of reinvent our programming overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, so much of our programming is focused on getting residents out of their apartments. And now we want them to stay in their apartments, but we want them to stay engaged. And so, you know, we've put together a whole bunch of things that we're doing. I probably won't even be able to talk about all of them, but you know, some of the highlights are, you know, every morning the residents get a packet on their breakfast tray uh, and it's, we call it the Daily Chronicle. It has uh, some things that happen in history that day. It has word games, it has puzzles, it has trivia, mm. biographies, and it varies every day. And it's something that they can do in their apartment. It also helps provide that structure, you know, that the other panelists were talking about and help reorient them to the day uh, and gives them something to do throughout the day. And then we do another handout that our resident services department actually does at, with their lunchtime tray because all their meals are being delivered to their rooms. Mm -hmm. And that one has uh, the TV guide. It has usually a note from management. Today it has something about going out about Passover because today's the start of Passover. 
uh, we have like a weekly poem and that goes out on the lunch tray. And so it helps, you know, it's a chance for us to say hello. We also started, we got stickers with all of our department heads faces to put on the lunch trays just to, you know, so that they can see some familiar faces. Um, we also put together an activity cart and our mobile activity cart, we can bring it to residence rooms. It has all kinds of supplies, including watercolor kits, uh, decks of cards, greeting cards that they can send to their neighbors. We can deliver origami. Uh, I recently just got a quilt that I'm going to give them each uh, a square of the quilt mm -hmm. and then they decorate it. And then at the end, we're going to put it all together and it'll be like a Corona oh, quilt. And it's nice. kind of that, you know, yeah. that we're doing something together, but apart. Right. Exactly. Uh, and we're really trying to foster that, you know, we mm -hmm. also have a DVD cart that we, they can borrow DVDs. We're doing exercise handouts. Uh, and then, you know, we're also, our big program is our virtual visits. So we've dedicated our laptop to providing Zoom visits for residents and their families. And the family members can go and sign up online. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're offering this in half hour slots every day. And we're pretty much booked for weeks. Uh, we'll continue to do it until this ends, but it's just been the most, I think, heartwarming thing to see, you know, to have uh, somebody say to their mom, mom, it's so good to see you. I'm glad to see you on the screen. And then to have our residents say, I never could have imagined when I was younger that something like this could have been possible mm -hmm. where, you know, I can't see my son or daughter in person, but I can see them on the screen. And so that's been really cool. And yeah. we're trying to yeah. set it up for residents who have that capability nice. in their rooms. Yeah. In well. a way it's leading to, I'm seeing this in my own family. We're doing these Zoom things with my in-laws in Florida and the whole family mm -hmm. is getting together every Sunday. And it's like, wait, this is a little too much togetherness for me. <laughs> we have so. a couple of residents who are actually gathering with their families today to do Passover Seder. Yeah. Happy Passover, tonight, everyone. Through Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've heard of a lot of virtual satyrs. Um, okay, great. Gloria, tell us quickly about your, um, your setup with your mom. Sure. Well, we're a care system for one, really, here at home. Uh, my mom has lived with us for a number of years. Uh, she's 96. She's uh, able to walk only with assistance from an aide and a walker, or she's in a wheelchair. So we have two challenges. One is to shelter her and keep her safe. Uh, we have four caregivers who come in and out of the house and to manage the, the system so that it's safe for all and uh, safe for her. And then, uh, and I'm happy to talk more about the system we have in place. Uh, then there's the question of uh, her now being, she still went out. Uh, to luncheons, to church, to visit family members, to events with me, with other family members, or with the caregivers accompanying her. Uh, that's all cut off at this point. Uh, the physical therapist can't come in. The massage therapist can't come in. Uh, and so what we've done is replace these with a variety of activities. Um, it is, my mom was a professional woman. She actually was a radio broadcaster. Mm. So I am doing my radio voiceovers from home as mm -hmm. well as recording programs like this. So she's actually here in the studio audience, so to speak, at the other end of the living room. And uh, so I try to engage her. So the fact that I'm working at home instead of being where you are, Katie, at the Commonwealth Club, uh, means that I'm here and I try to engage her in whatever is going on. So if we're doing a program and then I will show this to her later, uh, you know, so she can see everybody, I'll put it on the TV so she can see it. So engaging her in whatever is going on, if I'm cooking, making sure she's in the kitchen, if I go out to pick some herbs or fruit in the garden, I bring it and show it to her. So just sort of engaging her in whatever is going on in the household. Then we are uh, supported by a lot of virtual activities. Um, our church started doing virtual services a couple weeks ago. Mm. 
That's mm -hmm. uh, in, over in Lafayette, in Lafayette United Methodist Church. And the minister is doing a great job and she's gotten better and better at it. So we're able to participate in that. And she has members of the congregation recording videos when we sort of greet each other normally during mm -hmm. the service. So we have virtual greetings and then she shows those, you know, as part of the service. So there are a variety of virtual activities um, that are replacing the, the activities. We're also becoming very versatile at home. Um, so one of our caregivers uh, previously uh, was licensed as a barber and haircutter. So uh, mm -hmm. several of us are going to have haircuts later today. Uh, we have found <laughs> Can ways, I come? <laughs> yeah, we have found ways uh, to replicate the services that we had. Uh, one of the caregivers is doing physical exercise with my mom. We have the mm -hmm. equipment here that the therapist was using. So we've replaced activities and just tried to engage her in whatever is going on. Mm -hmm. That that's that's great. Um, you're a wonderful daughter. I would just like to say. Uh, I'd like to go back um, to Patrick. Uh, Patrick, I came to visit you when I was working on the loneliness story. Um, one of the things I did was go to England where they have something called the silver line where um, uh, older adults uh, call in uh, to this, li this line and it's a very, very busy uh, call center. Basically, if they're feeling lonely and just for someone to talk to. And I have to say, I started the story with that because it was uh, it was heartbreaking. I got to listen in on um, a lot of the calls for an entire day and uh, it was absolutely heartbreaking. And so I came, I was wondering, is there anything like that? Um, and we're not gonna stay on this really downer note too long, um, but we really need to address this because um, it's a it's a big danger, and um, so I was wondering when I was working on the story, is there anything like that in the states? And really, the only thing I found like it is your friendship line. And I'm wondering if you're thinking now. Um, I know you guys don't operate on a huge budget, but I'm wondering huh. if there's have you talked to the folks in England about doing something similar in the states, um, evolving it, growing it? Well. Absolutely, I think that what you had uh, led with with your story uh, about England, I think, really is a just a, a, a such a great model uh, for us here in the states. I just love that they have a uh, a loneliness czar, you know, someone who yeah. you know has oh, right, the, right, right. Yes, right? The, the UK and now has a loneliness a minister for loneliness, or yeah. isn't that <laughs> you know that I, I just think that is fabulous mm -hmm. uh, because. I think our, our problem uh, in this culture is we have such a strong value in independence, uh, autonomy, mm -hmm. and we really prize that. And uh, so what I've seen over the last, since Friendship Line began, this is our 47th year, is that my, my perception of our society is that we've grown less able to stay connected. And I think that's one of the pillars upon which Friendship Line was built was connections. I believe then, and I believe even more so now, that connections with others are what bind us to life. Mm. And, uh, and I love that all of us on this panel are finding creative ways mm -hmm. to stay connected to our you know, uh, target populations. And, uh, and one of the other things that, has, um, that I think Friendship Line is a little different than some of the other programs uh, probably not as different than 30th Street, but what we see is that the people that really bear the brunt of these kinds of social uh, problems uh, are the poor, you know, uh, the disabled, um, uh, older women and, and older men, and particularly uh, minorities. And uh, so the program was really built trying to connect those individuals you know, with paid staff and volunteers uh, who are willing to share their compassion with uh, these individuals mm -hmm. who may not have access to computers and may not understand right. how to use them because many of our clients have, you know, cognitive impairment or, you know, mild to moderate um, symptoms of dementia. So uh, 
you know, we've seen that that that's the, the, the group that we're really trying to stay connected with as, uh, as much as we can. And, um, you know, I just think that that these ways that we're doing things like the volunteers that uh, Andy was talking about and the group that uh, Emma's talking about, and that's, you know, what you're doing with your mother, Gloria, you know, is really trying to keep them involved, you know, yeah. uh, that they have meaning and that, uh, that we don't want to let anybody feel forgotten. And I also just want to uh, praise our volunteers on the friendship line, but also our volunteers who call out to our older people and younger people who are dealing with trauma. You know, we have a gentleman I was talking to earlier whose wife died suddenly on a cruise ship uh, mm -hmm. right before this coronavirus hit. And so he's grieving, but he can't be, you know, close to family members uh, uh, except virtually. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and he's another who is, he's saying, you know, not only am I now separated from living family members, uh, but I'm also struggling with the loss of my wife who died, I think, March 3rd or something like that. Speaking and, uh, of, um, uh, speaking how, of, of men, uh, speaking of men I, and women, that what I found when I was doing the story is that 70% um, of the calls that go into Silverline are from women. And that men, it's harder for men yeah. to... Uh, to step up and say, I feel isolate, isolated and lonely. Have you found that to be the case? Absolutely. And we see the same thing in terms of the uh, percentage of people that call us, that the majority of our callers are uh, female. And it's very difficult, I think, for men to admit mm -hmm. uh, loneliness, again, because of that way in which we condition men, not just Caucasian men, but I think men from other cultures are really raised uh, to be strong, to be tough, uh, and yet they're suffering. Um, and that's a real concern. And we have also noticed on Friendship Line since probably around the middle of the month of March that our call volume has been increasing. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're trying to expand the services of Friendship Line, um, where in the beginning, when I started Friendship Line, if we had 100 people mm -hmm. that called in a month, I thought that was a lot. Yeah. And uh, uh, in the month of February, we had about 18,000 calls in the month. Wow. And, and, what so we're far, estimating and in March, for, did you have... And in March, to... we mm -hmm. feel that we're going to have probably at least 2,000 calls. Wow. And in April, May, you know, it's just going to increase. We're anticipating um, that probably in the next couple of months, we might be having 24,000 calls uh, per month. And uh, that's really putting a strain on our resources. Yeah, but, so but anyone out Katie, there who wants to, yes, John. And John Blazik, um, I just want to say, uh, I think too, uh, Patrick, it helps to frame this in terms of self-help. And uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine who's, I said, well, what, what do you see as self-help? And he said, well, if you're tired, rest. If you're thirsty, drink. Mm -hmm. If you're lonely, call a friend. Right. And so there is something upon us that we have to take advantage of. So we of these opportunities and it's difficult, but we have to encourage people to be able to say, I need help. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a hospitality line. Uh, and I always say in through their door, out through ours. And meaning if someone just calls to talk, then we can yeah. connect them to a psycho. We have like a psychologist who has a yeah. therapy group that talks about loneliness. So we can, mm -hmm. um, uh, tell them that we have this uh, friendship calls that, that we are making here. So um, it's a tough thing, but at a certain point, a person has to take advantage of all these services and be able to say, yeah, I need some help. And it's a, as you said, it's like a basic human need. Like yeah. if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, if you're lonely, it's a very hard, it's stigmatized. Yeah. It's difficult yeah. to, and then uh, with men, there's this, like, this notion of shoulder to shoulder that men will be yeah. like, doing woodwork together or golfing together, and then they will talk, confide in each other and really bond. Right. And then that... we, we have that, we have that with our um, always active, which is an exercise program. So people are coming to exercise, but then afterwards online, uh, the socialization afterwards and the chatting that takes place is as important 
mm-hmm. or almost yeah, as important as actual exercise. On, online socialization. The, the, the online so, socialization. That's socializing. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take one question from um, from you folks out there. Uh, this is from Ann Oppenheimer. Uh, what do you do with a senior, my mother, who is <laughs> stubborn and doesn't want to Zoom, do online classes, or come be with us? She's 80, extremely healthy, and lives alone. Who wants to take that one? Em, I'm happy like to Emma's talk about, about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that try new things. You know, there's uh, maybe there's some things that she could maybe do uh, on her own in her apartment, you know, like word games or puzzles or things like that, that then may give you a conversation starter as well. Um, you know, so always trying new things, um, you know, and I think Zoom isn't for everybody, you know, we've had, we've done Zoom, you know, with some of our memory care residents who, who don't understand what it is. They think Mm -hmm. it's just kind of a video. They don't understand Mm -hmm. that it's interactive. Mm -hmm. Um, And so in that case, it's more for the family than it Mm -hmm. is for that particular resident, um, although they get to see their family. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, I don't think, you know, I think that one thing that this shows us is that, uh, technology can only do so much sometimes. Um, and while we can utilize these, these services, you know, the conversation, maybe try calling your mom from the other room, Mm -hmm. see if that works. If she doesn't want to be physically with you in the room, I know that's kind of a weird idea, but it works. She might be Uh, amused. Yeah. Yeah. She might think it's kind of funny. (laughs) So uh, along those lines, Emma, as long as we've got you, um, Candice uh, Milford uh, asks, Emma, have you found that resistance to the use of technology has lessened as your residents use it more? And do you think this will have an impact on on future programming? Uh, I definitely think so. You know, the, the residents, uh, it's been hard sometimes in the past for residents to ask for help, right? We were talking right. about how difficult it is to ask for help and especially around technology. And so, you know, they haven't wanted to ask for help, but we're, we're kind of forced into this situation where this is one of the few ways that we have to connect with our loved ones. They're kind of more open to trying it out and seeing that maybe it's not as scary. And I think it's something that will, you know, we may try and, keep going. And right. we've had calls with people in Israel. So it's something that we can kind of keep going even after this kind of social distancing is. I, I would just know. add that for good or for bad, um, this, this new need for technology is really creating um, opportunities for people to try new things and to get their equipment up to date and other stuff. And our, our volunteers are really active in attempting to, to support and work with them virtually with, with our members. Um, but, but I do feel like there's, there's a pro and a con to that. Yes, in this day and age, to be able to be online and to use all the tools and resources is imperative. But there's also concern about that. How's that going to affect intimacy and connection and um, personal, personal relatedness? Yeah. Over- um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about um, people having to ask for help, but too, like with our friendship calls, our wellness calls, we're actually proactively calling seniors that we know and asking, it's kind of like you said, I'm like trying new things. We're asking them outright, like, how are you? Uh, how are you, how's your food situation? Cause we can connect them with that. Uh, or with a case manager if they have more systemic problems. So we have our team here actually calling people, uh, and uh, I think that can help overcome some of the resistance. Yeah, sort of like tying in with what Patrick does. I mean, maybe we should start thinking about brigades of people. You know, they did this uh, yeah. in in England too, with it not just calling in, but like regularly calling out. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't take that much. Uh, to pick up the phone and do that. I think um, there's a 
lot of readiness and interest right now for people to get to connect in that way because right. people have more time more and you know we we make calls to our, our the members and they pick up the phone it's like whoa because right. so typically you're leaving messages right but but i think the tricky thing is you know there needs to be some sort of screening and training right. and preparing of volunteers to be able to come in respectfully and then also in in cases where there's situations to be able to to know who to turn to and how to manage them. Yeah, well maybe I you guys offline to, could could get together and do something about that. I think we have to also make a distinction between uh being alone in your home or apartment mm -hmm. uh and solitude. Right. And I think a lot of older people um uh, many of them older volunteers on the friendship line or with our grief services uh, really value their solitude um, and would not perceive themselves as being mm -hmm. lonely or isolated. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be thoughtful about not making an assumption that just because an older woman is living alone that she is uh, lonely right. and isolated. Gloria, it uh, looks like you wanted to yeah. say something. Well, we're obviously thinking about this a lot at the Commonwealth Club, since we shifted entirely to digital programs, how much of this is going to stay and how much are things going to go back to doing things in person. I personally think that a lot of the institutions that have moved in a digital direction are going to keep doing a lot of that. Um, and so it just points up the fact that the types of programs that work with seniors, train seniors, provide technology for seniors. Those are systems that are good to have in place, obviously, before there's a crisis. And I really commend the organizations that have been, been working on that for years. And I think we're going to need to continue to work on that because I think it will be a more digital world for seniors and everybody else after this. Okay. Uh, Gloria, as long as I, I think you might be a good person to to address this question that has come in um, uh, from Aggie Freeman, uh, what is the best way to handle uh, fears that seniors are expressing from watching the news on TV that gives the worst case scenarios? Well, and that's a very important question, because as you know, it's a a feed constantly on CNN and elsewhere of the latest terrible bad news. So I, I really do look at that with my mom. Uh, she may sit, you know, and watch this a lot of the day on, on TV. Uh, so we talk about it quite a bit. I try to balance it somewhat, um, but also find constructive things to do. So mm -hmm. We live right near Valley Medical Center. And as you know, Santa Clara County is very a very big hotspot here. And so we got a request from a friend who's a doctor who practices at VMC asking for donations towards, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, uh, primary protective equipment for the doctors at Valley Medical Center. So I sat down with my mom and said, now we have this request. And so here's what's going on. And, you know, I think I'm going to make a, a small donation to this. And so I kind of involved her in that process. How can we help? How can we be involved? And she, of course, since she's a very philanthropic person said, no, I want to do it. You know, I, I uh, what can I give? And so um, it's finding the, the positive aspects or the constructive aspects. It's not just doom and gloom. What can we do to help? Mm -hmm. And where is there some news that's a little more positive mm -hmm. about, you know, bending the curve and about, uh, the, um, you know, positive, more positive stories about vaccines and about treatments and so on. And also San Francisco has this great, you know, so far knock on mm. this um, yeah. for having flattened the curve, at least so far, right? Katie, um, I recently uh, looked back this, this week in preparation for this from uh, Victor Franco's book, The Meaning of Life. And uh, he, he was a Holocaust survivor. And uh, he talked about what distinguished people who can get through really, really difficult times. Mm. And one, he talked about four simple things. He said, one, have something to do, like work that you do, uh, either if, even if it's knitting or um, gardening or volunteering. And then he talked about doing that with love. So it gives you a purpose. Mm. Uh, and then he said um, that... Uh, when you do this, uh, it'll give meaning uh, to your life. And so uh, he distinguished himself that way. 
And he said, um, I wrote this down actually, uh, oh, that courage is a choice. Fear, like Pat was talking about, everyone's afraid. It's an emotional reaction. We can accept it, can't control it. But then make a decision and try and really say to yourself, I'm going to try and be courageous in the face of this. And he said that those three things work, doing it with love and then saying, I'm going to try and be courageous are ways that we can find meaning through even the worst of circumstances. So that was very inspiring to me. And I, I think uh, it's something to think about as we as we confront an emotion of fear. Uh, one more uh, question um, on loneliness uh, from Celeste Burroughs. I don't feel lonely, but I feel that the absence of my usual in-person contact will eventually take its toll. At mm. some point, should an apparently healthy over 70 year resume resume, sorry, 70, 70 year old resume some normal contacts. Nor I'm not sure what Celeste means by normal. Um, I mean, we, this is the thing we don't we actually do not know. How much longer is it? You know, it's a lot of it is up to what this virus curve decides to do, what London Breed decides to do. My husband thinks it's mid-May um, when we resume normal contact. Uh, what do you guys think? I just think that that's a really good example. Say, oh, Patrick, you just broke up a little bit. Many people have not. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Is it coming through? Uh, I, I think this is exactly what we're talking about is that we have uh, programs represented here uh, today um, that could be helpful to Celeste. That it's not, we don't want her to perceive the fact that she feels lonely um, as something, as you said earlier, Katie, something that is stigmatized that she may never has called the friendship line or never heard of the village movement or, you know, other kinds of uh, programs. And I would urge her to uh, pick up the phone and call uh, just to have another um, outlet uh, so that she could hear another caring voice, you know, on the friendship line or any, any other Right. I, 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 you know, I, I obviously I can't today. speak for Celeste, uh, but, but she has to have courage. Right. And, and um, my, my thinking, though, and she's hit on something really profound, if Celeste, if I might extrapolate from what you wrote, is that losing the physical contact will eventually take its toll. And that's something that it, I'd love anybody to... Uh, address. Can I speak Emma, please. or interrupt yes. for a minute? So mm -hmm. we, we also have a memory care unit at Rhoda Goldman Plaza, which, you know, it's impossible to, to have them maintain the idea of social distancing. So mm. we're actually still having activities on our memory care unit, but we've taken steps to try and reduce risk and, uh, and help you know, still have that engagement and that being with people. You know, one of the things that I do are hand sanitizer massages. So I'm wearing really? a mask, I'm wearing gloves, uh -huh. and I'm giving them a massage with hand sanitizer. Wow. wow. You know, and so there may be ways in the future once we kind of get, you know, wherever, whatever back to normal means, we're still going to need to take precautions. And so you know, just finding those ways to adapt in, in this new kind of situation, this new life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think too, like we deliver over 130,000 meals to people at their homes and we're gearing up for more, but part of that is a wellness visit, mm -hmm. but there is a physicality to that. So to be present in the moment mm -hmm. and to receive the food and then to eat it and allow it to nourish your body, you know, there's something, there is some physicality to that, that it is maybe not a person you know, giving you a hug, but it is um, a way of uh, concretizing or making manifest the uh, care that our people here at 30th Street are um, giving to the people that we serve. So it's different, but it is real. 
That's great. Katie, Andy, you, wanna... you, you had something to say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say hi, Celeste. Uh, Celeste is a member of our village oh, and hi, is, is uh, actually the, a leader of our one of our walking groups and is very active in getting out there. So I, I get that there's a, a, a hunger to be physical, to be out yeah. there. And I was surprised. We actually had before the shelter in place happened, the you know the outdoor walking groups were gearing up and getting ready to do it on a, a on a many many times a, a week. Mm. And um, when the shelter in place happened, they they stopped. And I'm I want to talk with you because I actually feel like at six foot, you know, why can that not still happen with distance? Um, I went to the beach with my family um, last week at, um, at Ocean Beach, and it was just. Lo lovely and luscious and the breeze and other stuff and we kept distance from people and I think that's still okay so mm -hmm. I I would just encourage people to stay engaged with your body and find ways to um, be connected from a distance we have this exercise program called always active and uh, over 70 people joined it this week and like I said I mean there is again a physicality to at least using your body in a way with other in concert with other people that hopefully gives some sense of connectedness. Um, all right, one, uh, another one from, uh, from the audience. Uh, this is from Generations Now. Uh, my father was an early COVID casualty in memory care. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Should we follow the advice of the mayor of LA and bring parents out of community residences and bring them home. This is mm. a this is a huge question, uh, Emma. I see you light up here. Uh, I think that's a hard question that is going to be different for every situation. Mm. There, you know, it's about balancing whether or not you can provide the same physical care that's necessary and the same engagement um, with somebody with memory impairment at home. You know, a lot of our memory care residents require a different level of physical care. Right. And a lot of families are not able to do that at home, and that's okay. Uh, and so, you know, I actually think sometimes when I'm at work, because I'm still in the office, you know, interacting with people, that it's actually cleaner than, say, when I'm going home mm -hmm. and going into my apartment building. I actually feel more clean and more. Uh, I don't know, protected at Rhoda Goldman because of all the measures that we're taking. So, but it's different for everybody. Well, Gloria, you have a very interesting and intricate setup. Can you walk us through it very, uh, very quickly of at-home care? Sure. And we've been doing this for nine years, I guess. Uh, so we have four caregivers. Uh, we're very fortunate that they have been with us for up to eight years. Wow. Uh, the individuals. Wow. So they are individuals we know, practically part of our family, uh, very reliable. In fact, the one who's been with us for eight years, my mom has known for 20 years because she he took care of two of her older friends before they passed away. So we trust them very much. Um, I, we make sure that our physical uh, protections are very good. Each caregiver has a thermometer, uh, masks, gloves. Uh, we provide them with what they need to stay safe, both here and away from here, and to keep us safe. And you, and these are ironclad rules. Uh, one of the stories uh, I did was precautions for older adults and people with home health aides can be intimidated by their home health aides and don't have the courage to say, um, wear the mask or put on the gloves, right? right? There's a, a big sign on our front door that says, mm -hmm. uh, put on your mask, um, take your temperature, uh, or you know, I monitor that and so on. Uh, so we do monitor, but again, these are people who are very close to us and it's a very friendly and kindly relationship. Um, you know. We, we do go out for walks. It's possible, you know, it's possible to manage this, but I would say if I were trying to do it from startup at this time, one would have to find potentially new caregivers. Yes. Or one would have to do the care oneself. Um, it's years of experience that have gone into having a safe and effective system at home for somebody of this age and this level of needing care. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would just say, 
I could give you a laundry list of how to do it. And in fact, I'm thinking of posting some of this somewhere online of how we do it at home, but uh, it would be very hard for somebody who hadn't put this in place already. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, another question for Emma from Candace uh, Milford. Emma, are there different reactions from residents with memory impairment versus those without in terms of changes in delivery of services? Or is there more anxiety, less anxiety? Uh, uh, I think there's less anxiety on memory care because people aren't retaining what's going on in the world. But at the same time, you know, I, of course, I'm wearing a mask uh, when I'm interacting with memory care residents. And their first question is, why are you wearing that stupid thing on your face? Um, and, you know, you, you just try and manage it in the moment and I make a joke out of it, or I, you know, I say that it's something I want to protect you. Um, and we just have conversations about it. Um, and there is a lot of anxiety, I think, among our residents, uh, you know, talking about the unknown. Um, but I think on, on memory care, sometimes we just, we kind of talk about it and then we move on uh, because that's just kind of the nature. Um, so, yeah. We just got a really nice, uh, we have to sort of wrap this up pretty soon. And I thought it would be nice to end on a, on an up note, um, which is, uh, from Samyutka, um, Ramprasad said, my client just told me that she will learn to use the computer to be able to order stuff <laughs> since she <laughs> may actually end up not being able to go out and shop. She's willing to try something new and then a smiley face. Uh, nice, right? Uh, which is this idea of, you know, sort of embracing, you know, sort of love the tech you've got, uh, love the world you're with, <laughs> right? Love the one you're with. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's an up note. So I, you know, we only have a couple of minutes, and I'd like to sort of recap it, it, with you know sort of the things that we that we can take away from this. One thing, and you know, I don't want to sort of sound like I keep beating the drum on this, but this idea of a place uh, for people to call. Um, Patrick is clearly getting thousands more calls than probably his budget and staff and volunteers can handle. Uh, needs more to John, same. Uh, this idea of actually brigades of volunteers calling people, you know, if you want to be on the call line, then that's something to do. Uh, and then uh, these volunteers, as Andy was, was saying, you know, get out there and help people learn to use the technology in a way that isn't totally intimidating. Um, uh, any other takeaways as we plant these seeds here on this panel for going forward in this unprecedented time? I've just been hearing from each of you that in some way you're taking this opportunity to reach out and to really hold people. And, and I think that that's one of the things that we could really do in our organizations, uh, in our lives, but in our organizations to really kind of step forward and to exude some confidence and, and, and clarity that we're here with one another um, to, to get through this. Great. You know, and that, yeah. if I could add to that, um, I, if, during the darkest days of World War II, Winston Churchill was saying it, it wasn't the end. It wasn't the beginning of the end. It's the, it's the end of the beginning. Mm -hmm. And what he was saying is we're just getting started. And I think the effects of this are going to be very long term, wow. whether it's using, you know, virtual, but the PTSD, uh, how do we see ourselves as human beings? We're, we're just starting to um, understand what that is. But I think I can speak for everyone on this call that we are here for the long run. And we are committed to the people that are listening, that are either helping to serve people or are receiving these services, that we're going to be in this for the long haul. And we'll get through this together. And hopefully we'll be stronger communities because of it. Well, that's the end of our program. And thank you on, for ending it on that note. And that's and let's hope that it's the beginning 
of the beginning. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our panel for this very lively and let's hope groundbreaking discussion. Um, and we'd also like to thank you, our listening audience, on YouTube and Facebook live streaming. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, which is, by the way, commemorating its 118th year of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank and you. And every, everyone, thank you. <laughs>